Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. I'm just so confused as how this even happened today. Like the Capitol is supposed to be one of the safest places in the country and there's this breach. So I think it's an incredible sh show of white privilege, to be completely honest with you. It's sad and it's infuriating. How could this happen? Questions over security and whether we are all treated equally. San Antonio reacting to the chaos in Washington, D.C. Large crowds of pro-Trump demonstrators making their way first onto the stairs of our nation's capital and then this afternoon. While it started peacefully, rioters then made their way inside the building. Lawmakers told to hide under their desks as doors were barricaded and guns were drawn. Police at the Capitol confronting those inside as some made their way upstairs. Right now we're at this other place that we are extraordinarily divided again. One local professor gives us a look at how this tent, how these tense moments plays into our na nation's history. Plus what San Antonio city officials are expecting here at home. We have team coverage, but we begin with the latest on the Capitol chaos. One woman was shot and killed. We still don't know who shot her. Several officers were injured during the riot. A curfew in Washington, D.C. will remain in effect until tomorrow morning. The National Guard called in for crowd control. Meantime, let's take a live look in D.C. tonight. A much calmer scene than just hours earlier. Today's events unfolding as Congress tried to affirm President-elect Joe Biden's Electoral College win, a victory President Donald Trump has pushed back against, falsely claiming a stolen election. Congress was put on hold for several hours, but now their ceremonial certification of, of electoral votes continues tonight. And several area Texans had a front row seat to witness the chaos as it broke out. Maria Miller, a Victoria resident and member of Latinos for Trump, says she was attending a separate rally near the Capitol grounds. When it was over, she says they followed a peaceful crowd headed towards Capitol Hill. These are photos that she shared showing the thousands of people in the crowd in the Capitol Hill area. She said there were people there, though, that were also inciting violence. They were saying, charge, let's get in there. And he was waving his hand, you know, in a fist. And so everyone that was standing around was all looking around at each other. And he kept saying, why are you, why are you standing here? Let's go, charge. Her group made it to safety. They will head home from Washington, D.C. tomorrow. Meanwhile, President-elect Joe Biden is still set to take office in just a couple of weeks, and Facebook and Twitter have removed a video where current President Donald Trump made false claims about the election, Twitter even locking his account. Facebook also joined in blocking the president from posting on social media. Following the Capitol chaos, Vice President Mike Pence calling today a dark day in the history of the United States Capitol. Cameras were rolling as some smashed in windows inside the Capitol and crowds pulled open doors to get further inside. The violent moments leading to evacuations. As the unruly crowds were confronted, cameras also caught riot police peacefully moving people down the stairs of the Capitol. As the curfew neared, tear gas and percussion grenades were then used to clear the crowds. It's a sight some in San Antonio questioned and compared to the more forceful measures used during Black Lives Matter protests across the country last year. I just think it's very hypocritical that um, the U.S. and our politicians in charge are not doing much about the Trump supporters that are protesting right now. Um, but when it came to black lives and the protests that were happening, they um, shot it down immediately. It is unclear how many rioters were detained and how many were charged. Many who work on Capitol Hill say they are in disbelief about seeing the wave of people storm into what's usually a heavily secured area. The night team's Patty Santos tells us security was tightened on Capitol Hill, especially after 9-11. Pull, pull 
I've been in embassies that have been blown up and embassies that were trying to get overrun. And this is stuff you see over there. And it was happening in our own backyard, in our in our seat of power. Former CIA agent and former Texas U.S. Congressman Will Hurd says what he saw on Capitol Hill is like the chaos in unstable countries. This is not an example of a peaceful protest. You know, I think it's shaken the country. I am very, very saddened and uh, surprised that they got into the chambers. Those with experience working on Capitol Hill describe a place surrounded by barricades and tight security in and outside the building grounds since 9-11 until today. I saw them breaking windows in the Capitol. That is outrageous. We own it. The world watched as people broke their way in and lawmakers took cover. George Rodriguez worked for two administrations on the Hill from 75 to 93. We never saw anything like that, and I think it's outrageous. The concern is how this security breach will impact future public access to lawmakers. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Today's events will certainly go down in history. Has something like this ever happened before? And how do we move forward as a country? The night team's Tiffany Huerta speaks with one Trinity University professor who shares some insight. This is the day that we will remember. The certification of the Electoral College votes by Congress was disrupted as President Donald Trump supporters breached the Capitol building. Our democracy is under an unprecedented assault. We have a large segment of our population who believes that this election was a fraud without evidence, but they believe that. We have another segment of America that believes that it's completely legitimate. Carrie Lattimore, associate professor of history at Trinity University, says there's been similar instances in the past. One is the Wilmington riots of 1898, and that's a case in Wilmington, North Carolina, in which you had um, some rioters who disputed an election, and so they decided to go and try to take over a town, and so to kind of decertify by their own self a local election. As the country moves forward, Lattimore says there needs to be an emphasis on vetting information. When you hear people in high positions sprouting off conspiracy theories and, and unvetted ideas and, and, and just theories, it's not helpful. We need our leaders to be grounded in evidence and evidence thoughts and, and, and things that have been sourced. This presidential election has undergone vote recounts and no widespread fraud was found. Courts also dismissed claims brought on by the Trump administration. Lattimore says while it's been a difficult day, we've had very difficult days before. We somehow got through a civil war that ripped us apart in the two nations. Um, we got through a civil rights movement and we're still pushing through to make it a better nation for everybody. But we found ways of moving forward. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Now, the city of San Antonio did not see widespread po protests today. There were crowds in Fredericksburg, though, but Trump supporters there gathered peacefully from what our crews witnessed while we were there. As for what to expect here at home, Mayor Ron Nuremberg says they don't have any reports of massive protests happening here in the near future, but they are prepared. All of our law enforcement, and that's multiple agencies, including uh, the yeah. Sheriff's Department and SAPD, among others, uh, are prepared, uh, as they always will be. Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra also reacting to the violent scene at the Capitol. We have his full statement as he calls for peace. It's online right now at KSAT.com. To other news now, coronavirus cases continue to rise. Another 2,000 cases reported today, bringing the seven-day average to more than 1,500 every 24 hours. There were also four more deaths reported. The number of hospitalizations continued to hit new records. 1,341 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. 383 are in the intensive care unit, and 199 are on ventilators. New tonight, a man is dead after he was hit by a car. San Antonio police say it happened around 8 this evening on Hunt Lane, south of Marbach Road. Police say the man was walking along Hunt Lane when the crash happened. The driver told police they could not stop in time. Officers say the driver is not expected to face any charges because they remained on the scene. And for now, four children orphaned after a fatal crash on Sunday are being cared for by friends, family and church members. 
who are rallying around them. Lotus police say it appears the family had pulled out of a Dairy Queen in front of an oncoming pickup, and that resulted in killing those parents. Jesse DeGriado says their father, Craig Smith, 54, worked at Fort Sam Houston. His wife, Susie, 39, was a full-time mother. Craig and Susie Smith would have celebrated 18 years of marriage next month had it not been for last Sunday's crash in Holotus that suddenly ended their lives. They had just taken their four children to get ice cream. Their youngest and oldest, ages 16 and 5, were injured. The 15-year-old and 12-year-old were spared. They are honestly uh, deeply shaken, both physically and emotionally at this point. But the children, he says, are not alone, not hardly. There was an immediate impulse to reach out, to try to minister and to care for them. And although their parents are no longer with them. One of the tenets of our faith is that life is not the end. And uh, I know that Susie and Craig are on the other side now. He says in addition to their own families, the Smiths were part of a church family. It's our belief and our hope that as we surround them with love and support them, that it will not be an event that defines their life. Their faith, he says, is also why they pray for everyone involved that fateful night, including the other driver. We pray for her. We hope for healing uh, for her as well as for these beautiful children. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. All right, and we have some weather to talk about coming up. We've got some sunshine through Saturday, at least, then a rainy day on the way, and it's going to be colder. Mountain Cedar very high and is it going to stay there? We're going to talk about that coming right up. Thank you, Adam. We're going to head to Georgia where history was made. The vow Republicans made if they lost two runoff races in that state. And will that promise hold true? It's next on the night. Beat. A shift expected in the Senate. ABC News projects that both the Democratic contenders in the state of Georgia won their Senate runoff races. Republicans initially vowed to mount legal challenges if they lost, but Georgia Governor Brian Kemp shut down pressure to overturn the results after hundreds of Trump supporters took over the U.S. Capitol. ABC's Zareen Shaw tracking the latest. In a major victory, Democrats have seized control of the Senate after it became clear Wednesday that both John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock won the Georgia Senate runoff races against Republican incumbents David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler. Uh, in this moment, we've got to bring people together. Whether you were for me or against me, I'll be for you. The two projected winners both making history for the state. Ossoff, a former investigative reporter who will also be the youngest sitting senator and first Jewish senator from Georgia, and Warnock, a former pastor for a historic black church. The other day, because this is America, the 82-year-old hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton went to the polls and picked her youngest son to be a United States Senator. The Democrats' victories deeply consequential for Georgia and the nation, tipping the scales of power in the Senate. Democrats are now split with Republicans 50-50, with Democratic Vice President-elect Kamala Harris serving as tiebreaker. A majority for Senate Democrats could mean President-elect Joe Biden would have an easier time getting his agenda passed through Congress. And that has sparked massive GOP infighting, one of the state's top election officials placing the blame squarely on the president in a state Republicans have previously easily won. No evidence of any irregularities. The, the biggest thing we've seen is from the president's um, fertile mind of finding fraud where none exists. Now, the reason why these election results are so consequential is because it's going to be the first time in 10 years that Democrats will control both chambers of Congress. Zorin Shah, ABC News, Atlanta. Let's take a live look outside with live cam on this uh, chilly 56 degree evening as we uh, show you a live look at the quarry right now. Yes, yeah, Sky 12 getting us up close and personal with the smokestacks yeah. out there, Adam. I was say either they've got that zoom on high or they're yeah. flying mighty close, but it looks good outside. It is a little breezy out there. That's something that we're noticing. And we do have some cooler days ahead. Rain is going to likely hit us on Sunday. Still looking pretty promising for that and better rainfall potential than what we had this morning. We had a hundredth of an inch of rain at the airport today. Mountain Cedar, it remains very high. Let's start with that. Here's today's count. Highest yet this season, 21,900. 
20 grains per cubic meter. Now we all know the northwesterly breeze, which we now call the cedar breeze, likes to keep those cedar counts elevated because of the high concentration of those cedar trees in the hill country. And of course, San Antonio being downstream when you have that northwesterly wind. Well, I guess it continues tomorrow, a northwesterly wind and on into Friday and into Saturday and into Sunday. Basically, the rest of this week anticipate those elevated cedar counts because of this predominant northwesterly flow that then likes to take that mountain cedar out of the hill country and disperse it in San Antonio in other locations southeast of the hill country. Still a bit breezy out there right now. A steady wind at 15 miles per hour in San Antonio and at times will gust up to about 20. So here's the system that just clipped us earlier today, early this morning. We had some dampness, a few showers, and then we broke out into sunshine pretty quickly. The system strengthening farther to the east of us, so we just got a little appetizer of its real rain potential, which was especially in East Texas, Louisiana, and up into Arkansas. This is moving out of here, though. We're going to have sunshine for a few days behind it, and our focus now really shifts to a few of these ripples and swirls in the upper level flow, really over Alaska. That's going to be our next weather maker as we get into Sunday. So let's go through time here. Next couple of days, a lot of sunshine. You're talking Thursday, Friday, even on into Saturday, nothing to worry about. Just some increasing clouds by Saturday afternoon. But that's when that system should dig down toward Texas and start to stir things up. And we think into Sunday we'll start seeing some rain even first thing in the morning. And it's likely to be a lot more widespread than what we had earlier today. So much better rainfall potential wouldn't shock me if we saw several locations with a half an inch or more, especially east of I-35. But it's too early for any specifics like that. This is a system that hasn't even formed yet. We can't even measure it and we're trying to predict it. So it's too early for those specifics. But one thing that we're seeing indications of is some cooler air above us that could lead to some wet snowflakes in the hill country by Sunday afternoon. I think our chances in San Antonio slim to none right now, the way it, the pattern's setting up in the hill country. I wouldn't be surprised if we transition to a mix of rain and wet snow, but basically just white rain with it, you know, the impact would be little to none. That's the way it's looking right now. More of a, ooh, gee whiz, hey, look, there's some snow falling kind of situation. But we'll keep you updated as we get more info. Either way, rain chance is looking much better at that point. Today, a hundredth of an inch, that was it. We topped out at 73. Right now we're looking at 50s for most of us. Pleasanton, 55, Castroville as well, New Braunfels, 57, and some 40s in the hill country. Drier air as well in place, and you're gonna notice that lack of humidity for several days. Tomorrow morning, near 40, sunny and 66 into the afternoon, a bit breezy at times with that northwesterly wind at 10 to 20. Into Friday, you see those temperatures on the downswing near 60, Saturday 56, and Sunday a cold rain around town in the 40s. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, I'm always glad when the Spurs win. <laughs> it's extra sweet, though, when it's against a Kawhi-led Clippers. And you take a look at what happened in this game and how they were able to recover after getting out of the big lead. And one of the guys that helped in that recovery was a guy playing in his first ever NBA season, their number one draft pick, Devin Vassell. What he was able to do to help the Spurs win this game, it's only the seventh game of his professional career. And a big moment for that young lady right there. San Antonio Spurs have gotten their five-game road trip off to a great start with a 116-113 victory over the Clippers in L.A. Even though the Spurs got off to a great start and out to as much as a 24-point lead, the victory did not come easy. Everyone is talking about Patty Mills' career performance from three-point range with eight of the Spurs' 23-pointers, tying a franchise record. But it was still a challenge for the Spurs after being outscored 40-22 to in the third quarter behind Kawhi Leonard's game-high 30 points to actually take their only lead of the game at 86-85 in the fourth quarter. That's when the rookie Devin Bassell stepped up with a big time three the Clippers never had the lead again in fact the Spurs first lottery pick since Tim Duncan scored have its career high 12 points in the final quarter being able to you know kind of be a professional you got to go in every day knowing you know there's great guys ahead of you and just trying to be ready whenever your number is called you got to go in and practice you got to get extra shots you got to get extra reps um, and that's kind of what I've been doing that's exactly what I've been doing so um, like I said just being able to be ready when my number is called and um, it was great and it's going to keep happening during the season um, just like that. Spurs are staying in L.A. They take on the Lakers again tomorrow. This will be the third time they face the defending NBA champs tomorrow at 9 o'clock.
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. One of the big offseason questions for the Dallas Cowboys is, will Sean Lee return for his 12th season wearing the star? He was only able to play in nine games this season after suffering a sports hernia, unable to suit up until week eight of the season against the Eagles. That's after playing in all 16 games last season for the first time in his career. In his comeback, Lee played straight through for the rest of the season, including starting in the Cowboys' final two games due to Leighton Van Der Esch's ankle injury that sidelined him for the rest of the season. Van Der Esch was asked if he thinks Lee will return next season and what it has been like to have Lee as a teammate. It's special to have a guy like him around. Uh, they don't come around like that very often. And I mean, I'm, I'm if, if I get a chance to play with him again or, or whatever, if he's a coach, I don't know what I don't know what the situation is with him. And I'm gonna let him talk about that. Um, I'm just looking forward to whatever comes for him. And I know he's, he's the same way with everybody else. Uh, I wish the best for him. And Heck, if I can play another season with him or another two seasons, who knows? Um, I would absolutely love it. Now that the Houston Texans have found a new general manager and former Patriots director player personnel in Nick Casario, now the search begins for the new head coach. Casario is the same person the Texans tried to hire as a GM two years ago when the team fired Brian Gain as GM, but the Patriots had accused the Texans of tampering and they dropped their pursuit. Star quarterback Deshaun Watson was asked, was playing without a general manager a distraction for him? Nah, honestly, I wasn't even worried about that. I, I was just worried about playing football. Um, you know, the whole GM and coach situation right there, I was just, you know, that I didn't want that to be a distraction for me and my game and, and the things that I wanted to try to accomplish for this year. Arguably the best quarterback in college football declares for the NFL draft next. Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence announced today he is entering the NFL draft just one day after coming in second in the Heisman Trophy voting to the winner. Alabama's Devonta Smith became the first wide receiver to take the trophy in 29 years. Lawrence led the Tigers to a national championship as a freshman in 2018 and has made the college football playoffs in all three years at Clemson. Now he's expected to be the number one draft pick in the NFL this year. Big moment at Veterans Memorial High School today as Elizabeth Saxon signed her national letter intent to play soccer for St. Mary's University starting in the fall of 2021. She was surrounded by her family, friends, and teammates. Saxon signed her letter of intent with her parents, Kevin and Michelle, by her side, along with two of her three brothers, Jesse and Kevin. All her hard work paying off big time. Um, I'm really excited. It's been a long time in the making. Um, ever since I was a little girl, it's been my dream to go on and play at the collegiate level. So I'm just really excited to be furthering that at St. Mary's. And I think it's even more special that she's chosen to stay here in San Antonio uh, and continue that. You know, St. Mary's is a great program. They have an established history. Um, and so I'm excited to see her grow even more, uh, more than she's already done in the last four years. The Del Rio Consolidated Independent School District has suspended all UIL and extracurricular activities effective immediately due to a spike in the COVID-19 virus on the campus. That decision was posted on the district's Facebook page today following a meeting yesterday of district leaders. All games and practices will be suspended over the next two weeks beginning today. One game has been affected by the curfew ordered in our nation's capital following today's violent events and the resulting lockdown. George Washington men's basketball game against UMass that was supposed to be played tonight has been postponed. The Washington Wizards are out out of town playing in Philadelphia. There are no other games scheduled for Washington, D.C. tonight. A curfew that began at 6 p.m. tonight will last until 6 a.m. in the morning in the Washington, D.C. area. And we wait to see if that curfew is extended, see if it does indeed affect more sports in that area. Yeah. Isn't there a playoff game this or, weekend? Or playoff games as well Washington, for the NFL. Bay. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll wait to see what happens. All right. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Got some breaking news updates here. The D.C. police chief providing an update on the Capitol chaos. The chief saying the woman killed was shot by a Capitol Hill police officer. She was shot as the mob tried to break through a barricaded door inside the Capitol where police were armed on the other side. The identity of that woman has not been released as of yet. Yeah, three other people were told died from what was described as medical emergencies. We're told at least 14 officers were also injured during the riot and a curfew in Washington, D.C. will remain in effect until tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the Senate and the House still certifying the electoral vote count tonight. The House and Senate have upheld the election results from Arizona. Yeah, and it's expected that that process will go well into the night, into the morning hours, certainly at least in Washington, D.C. That's it for the Night Beat. Good morning, San Antonio at 4.30. Good night.